All right, thank you very much. Um, our group is interested in a technology platform that we call resident molecular signaling. And the idea here is that a lot of diseases, especially chronic disorders, are reflections of poor communication or lack of communication both within and between cells. And our notion is that if we find the right molecules or fractions of molecules in the right concentration, we can restore that communication and consequently allow the body to heal. One of those molecules in which we have a great deal of interest is called streptolite O. This is the ectotoxin secreted by group A beta hemolytic streptococci that cause strep throat. This is the toxin that causes the pain. What we do is oxidize it so it's no longer toxic. And what we find is that, and we find this by accident, uh, is that it has tremendous activity with respect to scarring in terms of preventing scars or ameliorating scars. We will worry about the spectrum of targets. We were interested in, in this molecule, as I say, by accident because in a patient that we were treating, using this molecule treating for something else, we found that her scars disappeared, her superficial scars. I wondered how on earth could that possibly be? So we started doing some big time science and we know that uh, Streptolysin O, among other things, is a potent anti-inflammatory agent. It uh, downregulates pro-inflammatory genes. That second one, MMP9, is especially important. Over the last decade, between eight and nine billion dollars have been spent by the pharmaceutical industry looking for products that downregulate MMP9 because it's involved in so many diseases. Several of those products have made it to formal clinical trials, and they have all failed because of toxicity. Uh, again, streptolysin O in our hands is not toxic. While it downregulates the pro inflammatory genes, it upregulates the anti inflammatory ones. These we're not going to get into the science of, but it's important that it is an anti inflammatory product, but it does a lot more than that. One of the things it does is disrupt the balance between collagen and collagenase. Collagen is the primary protein in scars, scars are not stable. Some of you have had scars from accidents or surgery or whatever that have been with you for decades, those are changing every day, although they look the same to you. They're, there's a constant turnover of the collagen. The collagenase, the enzyme is breaking down old collagen, new collagen is, being, is, is replacing the old. We upset the balance in favor of collagenase so that the old collagen is broken down and it's replaced by more vital tissue. We have so we started with looking at a series of superficial scars, and we found that external scars would all respond to SLO therapy. This is just a uh, kind of an example of, of some of the types of scars that we looked at. Here's a, a more graphic example. This is a face of a girl that just went through the windshield. If you look closely and get oriented, you can see there's her chin her teeth, her nose has been torn off and displaced. So she's in trouble. This is her in the emergency room at the Medical University of South Carolina in, uh, in Charleston. You can see she's gonna have a bit of a scar on her left cheek. Her nose is back in place. There's gonna be some serious scarring there. Look at the angle of that tube. It's ripped out the corner of her mouth. Gonna be some scars there and across her eyebrow also. So she's gonna look like a pirate, okay? Her mother was a nurse. She started right away, a nurse with us. She got to the, the mother got to the emergency room, started SLO therapy, and there she is three weeks later. And here she is a month after that last picture. Now, you can see that there's still a scar there, but it's going away. It's not nearly what you might expect. Little or no scarring around the nose. That corner of her mouth doesn't look too bad compared to what it did before. Jeez, oh man, the, uh, good, that'll be the next slide. Um, the point of all this is, the important point is, that nothing was given to her topically, all right? This is all systemic. So there's nothing rubbed on her skin to make the scar go away or to prevent the scar. So being clever scientists that we are, we wondered, well gosh, if this is going systemically and working on external scars, like this gal's face, what would happen with internal scars? Well. First you ask, what the heck are internal scars? 
these are a few of the ones that we've treated successfully. All of us have internal scars all the time, and there is what's called the collagen theory of aging that would suggest that our longevity is determined by the collagen that accumulates in our body. That is, as a consequence of normal function of the organs, there's constant inflammation, which is followed by collagen deposition. The collagen gets laid down, cross-linked, becomes less elastic. That's what happens with cardiomyopathy, for example. That scar tissue forming in the heart, the heart becomes less efficient as a consequence of that scar tissue, and there is um, less efficient signaling between nodes of the heart. Likewise with the kidneys and the, and the liver and so forth. Surgical adhesions, big deal. We had some fun with some patients that had surgical adhesions following gut surgery or gynecological surgery. We know that one of the complications after those kinds of surgeries is often adhesions. And what do you do for adhesions? Well, the surgeon goes back in and cuts them out. Well, guess what? Causes more adhesions. So if we, we found that we could give streptolysin O in very low concentrations, similar to the ones that Dr. Ives was talking about, and even lower, and those adhesions would go away in two weeks. No more surgery. That's a big deal. Question came up to us more recently, thinking back on the girl who went through the windshield, could SLO be used to treat traumatic brain injury? Now, clearly that's an internal type of scarring if it occurs, but it's different than anything else we've ever done for a couple of reasons. One is, there's a question, well, let's first look at what traumatic brain injury is. By definition, it's damage either temporary or permanent to the brain as a consequence of uh, injury. There are about a million and a half cases in this country per year. Of those, 50,000 will die, and 80,000 are going to have some degree of permanent disability. The most likely, or the most common causes of traumatic brain injury in our country are accidents, automobile, bicycle, pedestrian accidents. Um, second, probably second, uh, is in the military with all the different things that the military personnel might be exposed to. Assaults are a leading cause also. We wondered still, can we do anything about these kinds of injuries? And the reasons are these. We know that from the internal and external scars that seem to respond so successfully to SLO therapy, that those, are, those scars are involved with, uh, with collagen, which comes from fibroblasts. There are not fibroblasts in the brain, and there's not collagen in the brain. Instead, there are glial cells in the brain that people think have something to do with brain, what might be called brain scarring. So it's a question of collagen versus what? Well, nobody really knows what. Another problem is you can't really scan and see by any imaging techniques that are available, you can't see brain scars. Now, there are four or five FDA approved methods for brain scans, but none of them will show what we think a scar should look like, so you can't see before and afters. That's a lot different than internal and external scars. External scars, like the girl's face, it's easy to measure. Internal scars, you can also do. We've published a couple papers using sonography, for example, with uh, thoroughbred horses in Kentucky that we've done some work with, and we can see very clearly nice objective measurements about what happens with uh, scars as a consequence of SLO therapy. You can watch them go away. You can measure that. You can't do that in the brain. So what do we do instead? We're going to have to focus on clinical outcomes. Well, where are we going to find a few patients to fool around with? <laughs> Guess what? Uh, we'll go to uh, some NFL players down in the Phoenix area and see if they might participate. We started with six players. Uh, one of them dropped out after just about two months, disappeared, we had no follow-up. These others we followed for three years now, these five. And understand it's just a tiny, tiny number, but here are the original complaints. Not all the players had all these complaints, but this is a pretty good cross-section of what happened. It's interesting, none of these would be a surprise to you, especially to your psychiatrists and psychologists in the group. None of these would be surprised, a surprise for patients with repeated 
head injuries. Uh, but all of these players were having a real difficulty. They couldn't hold jobs. They were divorced. They couldn't make it, maintain a relationship with their girlfriends. One of them is a very well-known sports broadcaster who was having trouble remembering names and numbers. That's a problem for a sportscaster. And he was certainly concerned about losing his job. They couldn't concentrate. They had headaches. Uh, uh, this is really, really a tough situation. So we asked these guys if they would be willing to take SLO drops, one drop four times a day, one after each meal, one before bed. With all of our patients, for whatever disorder, whatever therapeutic agent we're using, we find that for the first two weeks, they are as compliant as can be. After that, you get bored taking drops and so forth. So we were hoping that they would take at least two drops a day. Put the darn dropper bottle by your toothbrush. Hope you brush your teeth twice a day. Take one morning and one at night. So they did. Within two weeks, we usually saw a change, or they saw a change. They were reporting changes. All the symptoms would get resolved. Uh, and the, the sportscaster had no trouble after two or three weeks remembering whatever he wanted to remember. No more headaches. Uh, it's not to say that all symptoms resolved in the equal rate of time or that all resolved completely, but there was resolution to one degree or another of all of them, and most of them now, after three years, are all resolved. It was interesting that if the patient got excited about imp their improvement and got tired of taking drops and stopped, sometimes there would be a regression, there would be a relapse, but that relapse would be very quickly reversed by reinitiating the drops. Nice, no adverse effects. Now, typical with our group is if we have a new idea that we think would be useful clinically, we try it on humans. If it looks safe and there are some positive results, then we do animal testing. <laughs> it's a little, little bit backwards than, than some people do, but that's worked out well for us. So just in the last two or three months, we started working with a, a group from a university some of you have heard of, and it's called Harvard, that has a, an animal model for, for traumatic brain injury. And they've agreed to cooperate with us and see what we can do. What happens in this model is you induce brain injury. Um, you can do it at mild, moderate, or severe injury. A pneumatically controlled metered force bangs the, the mouse in the head. You can do it once, multiple times, however you want to do it to try and reproduce what happens in a human situation. So we had three groups of animals in our first round. One, we, we damage and treat with SLO. One group gets damaged and, and only saline. And then the third group gets into the retainer but is not damaged and then gets uh, saline therapy. Okay, so that's a sham control, sham injury. And these are the things we wanted to measure. And again, this is just a screen to see if it's worth pursuing. Just like really the, the five football players were a screen to see if it's worth pursuing this whole notion of treating traumatic brain injury with SLO. So we wanted to measure balance, spatial, and performance memory, and then look at the histology, sacrifice the animals, and see what's happening in the brain. Here's what's happening. All parameters improved. Balance improved in 10 days after the, after the start of therapy. This next point is really interesting. The treated animals improved with balance so that it was even better than the sham controls that had never been injured. Now, I don't know how you go figure that, and it doesn't really matter. But the point is, they were as good as new, so to speak, if not a little bit better than new. Memory parameters have improved. And again, they're back to normal after about three weeks of therapy. And this is memory for both spatial and performance memory. And this slide is about 10 days old, so that last dot point is incorrect. We do have uh, histology report results back now. And the, um, the result is that there is decreased gliosis in the treated animals. Now, gliosis is defined as being an accumulation of nervous tissue in the central nervous system. We're not convinced that that definition is accurate anymore. We think that gliosis is going to refer to the accumulation really of brain scar tissue in the central nervous system as a consequence of injury. 
And we're seeing a reduction in that gliosis. Again, even with the mice, no adverse effects. So we have had patients with external and then internal scars on this therapy of SLO for years, and we've never seen an adverse effect. We now have the traumatic brain injury patients who are few and for, well, three years for the football players, no adverse effects. And we have done animal work just on the toxicology, and we have gone up to 5,000 times our normal dose given IV and still no adverse effects. So we're confident it's fairly safe. This is what we have planned in the near future. We want to continue our collaborative work, increase the, uh, the size of the mouse experiments. We want to look at animals with varying degrees of injury. And we also want to have um, various start times for SLO therapy. That is to say, T0 right after the time of injury, maybe even before the time of injury, and then 30, 60, 90 days after injury to start therapy. I should mention that there is an advantage in humans to starting SLO therapy before surgery, for example. Knowing now that we've had years of experience and the physicians in our group will consistently report that patients on SLO therapy before surgery will heal more quickly than would be anticipated. They need very little in the way of analgesics and you don't get any complications that would be associated with untoward scar tissue. We're going to expand the human treated population. We've had to turn away football players uh, that want to get into this study. We're working with a little, some, a little more formal way uh, now we're setting up to where we will have, we hope, nearly 100 um, patients involved. And we badly need to do more in the way of full psychological and physiological workups before, during, and after therapy. What I've told you about our TBI work is really screening work, but all the screening looks positive. So we're, we're fairly excited about this uh, because as far as we know, there's nothing else in the world, uh, literally, that addresses this problem. It is a big problem. I've talked with directors of veteran administration hospitals who, said, who say, come to our hospitals, we have whole wards of people we can work with. So this is what we are up to. The last thing we want to do, not last thing on the dot points, not necessarily last in terms of importance, is we're interested in what happens with SLO treatment for what might be called normal age-related dementia. Will it do anything? We know that with normal aging, the brain shrinks. That's been nicely measured. There's a question as to whether that shrinkage is directly associated with loss of cognition, memory, and things of that sort. We want to know what happens with SLO to the brain of the so-called normal person. So that's the normal elderly person. That's what we have in mind. Thank you. Thank you, John. Questions for John? A quick anecdote as people go up to the mic. I went through a glass window or glass door when I was 10 years old. That was a few weeks ago. And John gave me some mess. I had a big scar across my wrist. I almost bled to death. They couldn't stitch me back together. I'll show you. Do you know which one? <laughs> Scar's gone. <laughs> I was just wondering, uh, has the mainstream been reluctant to accept your? It's an interesting question. Uh, individual physicians and veterinarians have been very eager to embrace it because they know, number one, it's safe and there are not many alternatives. The Food and Drug Administration has been a little bit resistant because it's so darn new and a different approach. But I think in, in uh, not being flippant to your question, the mainstream has not had an opportunity to evaluate it to see. We have published a few papers about this. We do get requests every time we publish, we get requests from practitioners to try it you know, on patients, not as part of any study. Um, frankly, I think once we get it through the FDA, and we do have what's called an IND in place with the Food and Drug Administration now, I think once we get that through, I don't, I don't believe we're going to have much resistance, in part because there just isn't much else. And we have an ever older population, and people are getting afraid. And I think we can help. Yes, sir. 
Uh, thank you. It was really fascinating. Um, but I'm wondering, given what you do, what you have told us about the uh, the uh, interest that people have in getting in on these experiments, uh, it seems to me that uh, that uh, further torturing and sacrificing of the animals is marginal in terms of its morality. And um, I think the fact that we use the word sacrifice instead of kill indicates that we're trying to cloak that in some sort of a religious patina. So I wonder whether, whether it would be possible for you to consider not doing that part of it. It's an interesting point, and um, our interest is helping patients. Unfortunately, in order for us as a dinky company to get something that, as the previous questioner asked about, getting something accepted, the FDA and others ask for preclinical proof that this works. And what they mean by preclinical is animal experimentation. And you're right. If these football players are getting better and other patients are doing well, why on earth do you need to do any animal work? From a practical standpoint, you don't. From a regulatory standpoint, you do. And we're stuck. It's, it's a bummer, but that's just the way it is, I'm afraid. John, could you tell, answer two questions? One, could you give me the molecular weight of SLO? And two, what is the dose you're giving to people? Yeah, the molecular weight's about uh, 69,000 uh, Dalton. And the dose, a dose is about, uh, hmm, I can't tell you. I will tell you, but this is going to be false, and I'll tell you why. Um, we, when we make up the, the medicine, it's made up to a dose of about uh, 1.6 nanograms per dose. And I say that that is false because the vast majority of the SLO that goes into the vial adheres to the glass. So we have spent two years and a bunch of numbers of hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop what's called a release assay, which the FDA rightly requires to prove that what was in the vial at the start is still there at the end. And for us, it's not. So we have to go with what's called a functional assay. And as Dr. Ives mentioned, uh, we're, we're way below Avogadro's number, I do believe, in what's left in that vial. That's why we're gonna have to go to a functional assay instead of the typical chemical assay for, for dosage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hello. Um, I don't know any of the, a lot about traumatic brain injury, but uh, there's a fellow who I, a client that I work with who in a psychiatric uh, program who has a, a traumatic brain injury from a child who was hit by a car or something. And he hears voices, and his family says that, that they are related. He said that the voices began after the injury. Number one, is that a symptom? And number two, do you, have you experienced any alleviation of that symptom? We have, and even in, in the small number of football players we have, uh, one of the reasons why a couple of them had trouble holding jobs or maintaining interpersonal relationships was just that sort of problem. And that's not, I don't mean to imply for a second that SLO is the panacea for all brain problems, but if they are ones caused by traumatic brain injury, at least we have a chance to help them out. Yeah. Where can I get some? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got one small bottle and we well, can take bids. No, yeah. <laughs> Thank the you very much. The first one's free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, John. Yeah.